For 2,000 years, the story of one man's life and death has altered the world's perception of life and death. In an ancient city, a Jewish carpenter was hailed as a king, betrayed by a friend, and executed between two thieves during the most significant week in the history of the world. Accounts of this timeless drama have inspired 50 generations of artists and theologians, philosophers and kings, as its power has pierced the darkest moments of the human experience with the ultimate message of forgiveness and hope. This story, so enduring and revered, is called The Passion of Jesus Christ. The Passion of the Christ technically refers to the events leading up to and the event of the crucifixion itself. So it's the sufferings and it's the death of Jesus Christ. The idea of passion comes from the whole idea of suffering for sins. Uh, his suffering is not just uh, for himself, but it's for us. It is the greatest story ever told. Most accounts of the Passion of Christ describe a similar sequence of events. On a Thursday evening, Jesus and his disciples gathered to celebrate the Passover, the annual commemoration of Israel's liberation from bondage in Egypt. During the meal, Christ revealed that one of the twelve would betray him, Judas Iscariot. Later that night, Jesus traveled with his disciples outside Jerusalem's walls to a garden on the western slope of the Mount of Olives. While he agonized in prayer, Judas led a detachment of soldiers into the garden and identified Christ with a kiss. Jesus was arrested and taken back into the city. There, he stood in judgment before the Jewish high priests and the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. After an interrogation, Pilate ordered that he be beaten and then, succumbing to the demands of an angry mob, crucified. Through the crowded streets, Jesus carried the instrument of his execution. And at Calvary, he was nailed to the cross. By late afternoon, he was dead. He came to die. The Hebrew name of Jesus is Yeshua. It means salvation now, in the present tense. In order to reconcile humankind to God, it was necessary for him to be a sacrifice. You know, it's interesting, in the Old Testament of the Bible, we have the Hebrew nation offering sacrifices in order to try to atone for their sin. And we see Jesus as being the ultimate Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice who ultimately takes away the sin of the world. That was his mission, and he accomplished it on the cross. For two millennia, Accounts of the Passion of Christ and his atoning death have transcended language, culture, and nationality to touch countless lives in every corner of the world. It is not only the most compelling story in human history, it is probably the most well-known. Yet for all of its familiarity and spiritual significance, there is an aspect of this narrative that is often overlooked an extraordinary fact that elevates the story beyond all others. For the events that took place in Gethsemane, along the streets of Jerusalem, and on the barren rock of Calvary, were foretold, often in meticulous detail, centuries before they ever occurred. When you do go into the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament of the Bible, you really do see a description that unfolds in the events of the Passion. In other words, you see a script that was written hundreds of years before the events took place. And yet, they unfolded exactly as was foretold in those ancient writings. I don't know if Isaiah or Zechariah fully understood all that they were writing down. And by that I mean, I don't know if they fully understood how Jesus would fulfill all of this, but I believe these prophets are writing on specific details as the Lord was directing them to do so that were fulfilled 
in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Scholars have labeled the portions of the Hebrew scriptures that refer directly to the coming Redeemer as the Messianic prophecies. Conservatively, there are more than 100 of these predictions, dozens of which describe Christ's final days. To better grasp the meaning and importance of these prophecies, let us now examine the passion story through the words of the ancient authors who looked centuries into the future and saw it unfold. Tradition holds that the final week of Christ's life began near the now-sealed Golden Gate in the eastern corner of Jerusalem. On the tenth day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, Jesus entered the city, an event described in all four New Testament Gospels. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and he sat on it. And many cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest! They brought branches of palm and they put it on the ground because a king should not walk on the bare ground. And then they shouted, Hosanna ben David! Hosanna, son of David, save us, son of David. Meaning they have recognized him when saying save us as the Messiah. And then of course the title, son of David, meaning that he is a king. He would come in not as a conqueror, not as someone with a sword who was going to be a military Messiah who would overthrow the Roman government. That would have been a temporary solution to an historical problem. That is that the Romans enslaved people in that day. Jesus came with a much broader and more important mission, and that was to deal with the sin of the world. Jesus' triumphal procession through the streets of Jerusalem is a hallmark of the New Testament. Yet the most remarkable element of this iconic event may well be the prophecy that first described it. A prophecy delivered by the Hebrew priest Zechariah 500 years before Christ was born. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What Zechariah is saying, and we have to remember, Zechariah is writing after the Babylonian captivity. There is no king on the throne at that point. Uh, no one from the line of David is ruling as the king in Jerusalem. And what he's saying is, I see in the distant future, the king is coming again. The rightful heir of David, the son of David, is going to come riding on the donkey colt, the one who is anointed to be the Messiah. He makes a definite messianic promise and that is fulfilled when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. In this first century culture, when there was an anticipation, was the Messiah going to come? Who was he going to be? When would it happen? What would he exactly be like? To have Jesus emerge in a way that fulfilled the prophecies unlike anybody else was God's way of saying, you can trust Jesus. He is the one I sent. Following his entry into Jerusalem, Jesus spent the first part of the Passover week preaching to the crowds, healing the sick, and confronting the Jewish priests in the courtyard of the temple. His miracles and message angered the religious leaders so much, they decided he must die. On Thursday morning, Jesus instructed his disciples to prepare a room in the city for a celebration of the Passover feast. That evening, during the meal, 
he offered his own prophecy of impending death and resurrection. During the Passover Seder meal, he took the bread and he broke it and he prayed. Most people don't know what he prayed. And he prayed a Hebrew prayer that is being prayed until today. And he said, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And when he said, I am the bread of life, and he said, take eat. So he was prophesying to the disciples that he will be put to death and he will be in the grave and God the Father will raise him up. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who brings forth bread from the earth, meaning his body will be in the earth and it will be resurrected. As the disciples shared in the rich symbolism of the Passover meal, only Jesus was aware that one of them planned to betray him. After this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me, the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. And he gave it to Judas Iscariot. Judas's betrayal was no surprise to Jesus, for it had been predicted by the prophet David a thousand years before Christ broke bread with his disciples in the upper room. My close friend, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. The specific details in that passage remind us that he's not just going to be betrayed by anybody, but by a friend, and then a friend with whom he breaks bread. You can't miss the fact that this is Judas at the Last Supper. Uh, it is so obvious that the prophecy literally shouts to us about its fulfillment in the New Testament. The prophetic vision of Jesus' betrayal did not end with David's words in the 41st Psalm. In 500 BC, Zechariah also foretold another crucial detail. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. The fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy occurred more than five centuries later and is recorded in Matthew's Gospel. Then Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I betray him to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. The common slave price in the Old Testament was 20 pieces of silver. You may recall that uh, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. With inflation over time, by the time of the New Testament, it was 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed for the price of nothing more than a common slave. For Zechariah in the Old Testament era, to predict that it would be 30 pieces of silver, not 20, was contrary to the economics of the day, and yet it had a prediction involved in it that it would be exactly that amount of money. Each detail tells us specifically what is going to happen so that when it occurs, it is obvious this is the fulfillment of it. Following the Passover meal, Jesus led his disciples outside the city walls to the Mount of Olives and a garden called Gethsemane. It was a place they had often gathered during the three years of Christ's public ministry. I've been in that garden many times. It's one of the most beautiful spots on earth. You stand there among the olive trees that are still there all these centuries later, and you're looking right back into Jerusalem. As they are there that evening, Jesus leaves some of the disciples in one place. He takes the three from the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They go further into a deeper recess of the garden. It is there that Jesus throws himself on the ground, that he calls out to the Father and prays. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. 
yet not as I will, but as you will. As Christ agonized in prayer, he asked God for the strength to face the ordeal he knew was about to unfold, an ordeal described by the prophets centuries earlier. We must understand that the decision to go to the cross of Calvary was first made under the olive trees at Gethsemane. And we know Jesus was under pressure because being God, he had foreknowledge. He knew what was ahead. He knew that he was going to be betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He knew that he was going to bear the sin of the world. He knew that he was going to be crucified, that his back would be torn open. But I think the thing that he recoiled from the most was the knowledge that he who was holy and pure and sinless was going to take upon himself all that was unholy and impure and sinful. So indeed, it was the passion. In the gathering darkness, Judas led the temple guard into Gethsemane and identified Jesus with a kiss. Christ's betrayal was complete and prophecy again fulfilled. It had to happen. It had to happen. Someone had to give him away. He went with all the power in the world that he could control every single event, he went without resistance. As Christ was taken away by the temple guard, Peter leaped to the aid of his master, cutting off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Jesus immediately healed the wounded man and rebuked his disciple. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jesus dares to say that all the prophecies, the pictures, the illustrations in the Old Testament all point to me. He goes to the cross knowing what it is all about. He faces the prediction of these prophecies, knowing their fulfillment is not only that of the blessing of the kingdom yet to come, but of the suffering of the servant who must die in our place. Amidst the chaos of Christ's arrest, his disciples fled into hiding. Then abandoned and seemingly defenseless, Jesus was taken back into the city to face his accusers as the fulfillment of messianic prophecy accelerated. For wicked and deceitful men have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. On Friday morning, Jesus was subjected to two trials, one Jewish and religious, the other Roman and secular. In the first, many believe he was led up these steps to the home of the high priest, where he was interrogated by a hastily convened meeting of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Jewish Council. He knows from the prophecies that he has to be crucified. And that means he's got to be turned over to the Roman authorities. The Jews don't have the authority under Roman government to crucify anybody. They may on occasion stone somebody to death, as they do later with Stephen. But uh, the prophecies are not that this Messiah is going to be stoned to death, but that he's going to be pierced and nailed through. Uh, so in order for that to be fulfilled, you have the illegitimate trial that takes place in the middle of the night, trying to get him condemned as a heretic so that they can take him the next morning to Pilate and say this man is such a blasphemer he deserves to die. Christ's trial before the Sanhedrin began with the testimony of several false witnesses. Each failed to present a convincing reason to crucify him. 
Finally, Caiaphas, the high priest, confronted Jesus. The high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. Contrary to popular opinion, this Son of Man title is not a merely human title. The way it's used by Jesus, it's a claim to Messiahship. He claims to be a co-region on God's throne, sitting at the right hand of God, coming in the clouds, which in the Old Testament is a reference only to God, and coming in judgment. That combination of claims gets the proclamation in Mark that he's a blasphemer. You blasphemer! The high priest then tore his clothes. Why do you need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. Lacking the legal authority to crucify Jesus, the high priest ordered that he be taken to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, and a pivotal figure in the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Passion. Sanhedrin's decision to send Jesus to Pilate, a verdict that assured almost certain execution, stunned Judas Iscariot. Judas was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests. I have sinned, he said. I have betrayed innocent blood. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple. Like other key events in the Passion story, Judas' return of the price of Christ's betrayal had been predicted by the prophet Zechariah centuries earlier. So I took the thirty pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord. Beyond the southern wall of Jerusalem, the Hinnom Valley remains a testimony to the night of Christ's arrest and trial and the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. After Judas angrily returned the silver he had been paid, the high priest used the money to buy a small parcel of this land. There, the clay used to make the temple pottery was once excavated, so it was called the potter's field. And the Lord said, Throw it to the potter, that handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the thirty pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord, to the potter. God is a stickler for detail. We see this from Genesis to Revelation. And it's very important to God that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And I think he wanted us to see that in the death of Jesus, it was exactly as the Old Testament prophets had said it would be. For the mouths of the wicked have opened against me. At daybreak, Jesus was taken to the halls of the Roman Praetorium to stand trial before Pontius Pilate. The Jewish religious leaders wanted Pilate to order his immediate execution. We know from ancient writings that Pilate, he's not the kind of person who is slow to hand somebody over to death. He's not somebody who, oh boy, I don't have to do it. I'd really rather not kill this guy. I don't want to shed blood innocently. I don't think that's Pilate. Perhaps Pilate genuinely did see that this man was not worthy of death on political grounds that the Jews were claiming. And if there's a spiritual thing here, if you guys say he's offended your law, well, then you take him and try him. That's not my issue. So Pilate asked the Jews, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, 
take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But the Jews objected. We have no right to execute anyone. In an attempt to free himself from the responsibility of judgment, Pontius Pilate sent Jesus to Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, who was in Jerusalem for the Passover. However, like Pilate, Herod had little interest in condemning Jesus to death and was instead content to humiliate him. Herod plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, and dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent Jesus back to Pilate. Of all the prophetic scriptures, perhaps none is more important than the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. This remarkable vision of the future, written in approximately 700 BC, has been called the cornerstone of messianic prophecy. It was so powerful that when Isaiah received the vision, that he said, nobody's going to believe it. That's how he starts. This whole Prophecy shook his inner being because God has given him a complete picture and detailed description of what Messiah is going to look like, what he's going to do, and how he's going to die. And, I mean, there are other prophecies that come together with that, but this is really the central column of messianic prophecies. The accuracy of Isaiah's prophetic vision is underscored in the biblical accounts of Christ's trial before Pontius Pilate. By arrest and judgment, he was taken away. We know historically that Pilate was walking on eggshells with the Jewish people. He had had some earlier confrontations with them and he did not need another confrontation. I think if it was within his power, and he was not already in a conflicted situation with the Jewish people, he would have released Jesus. But because if he had one more incident, it could be a riot, he had to do something. Again, God was behind the scenes orchestrating these events. In their second encounter, Pilate interrogated Jesus alone in his chambers. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world, but it is from another place. For this reason, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Stunned by the power of Christ's response, Pilate turned away to address the crowd that had gathered in the courtyard of the Praetorium. I find no basis for a charge against him. Pilate said, What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Christ? They all answered, Crucify him. Despite the Jews' rejection of his appeal for mercy, Pilate made another desperate attempt to save Jesus from the cross. He ordered that Christ be beaten and scourged. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. People in the ancient world understood what a Roman flogging was like and that it was a horrendous uh, beating that left Jesus in hypovolemic shock, which is shock because of great blood loss. Normally that meant 40 lashes, less one for mercy. 39 lashes with the Roman whip, with the cat of nine tails, with broken pieces of metal and glass in the whip to rip the flesh open. And so it would rip into the skin, then it would rip into the skeletal tissue. Many men did not survive the actual scourging process, but again, even that was a fulfillment of scripture. With each lash of the Roman whip, 
Isaiah's predictions of a Messiah beaten mercilessly for the sins of all humanity were graphically fulfilled. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. And by his stripes, we are healed. Following Christ's brutal scourging, Pilate appealed to the crowd for the final time. He presented Jesus, beaten and crowned with thorns, with the hope they might have mercy upon him. When Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns, Pilate said to them, Behold the man. The chief priests shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Here is your king. Pilate said to the Jews, Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. And he handed Jesus over to be crucified. Now we have to understand that in the plan of God, all of this would fulfill what God had predicted in the future. The story of the crucifixion is not blamed on the Jews any more than it's blamed on the Romans and the Italians, uh, any more than it's blamed on Germans and Americans, because Jesus is going to the cross to die for the sins of all mankind, and it's our sins that nail him to the cross. These are merely the human players in the story, and the amazing thing is, we would never remember who Pontius Pilate was. We would never remember who King Herod was. They would have been forgotten by the sands of time had their lives not intersected the life that really matters in the story, and that's the life of Jesus Christ. And he rises above the critics, the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. He rises above the Roman governor until you are transfixed on one life, one savior, one man, who is willing to die for the sins of the world because he is God incarnate in human flesh. Modern Jerusalem bears little resemblance to the city where Jesus suffered and died. In the wake of its turbulent history, virtually all of its walls and buildings have been destroyed and reconstructed several times since the week of Christ's Passion. Yet today, pilgrims from throughout the world are still drawn to the narrow streets of the Eternal City to reflect upon a death unprecedented in its meaning, anguish, and prophetic significance. The crucifixion itself was designed by the Romans to extract maximum suffering. The streets going into the cities of Rome were often lined with crucified men as a warning to anybody who would dare to defy this political power. So it was designed to humiliate, to torture, to bring pain, and ultimately, over a period of days, to bring death. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which is called Golgotha. There, they crucified him. The crucifixion of Jesus is the foundation of Christian theology and the centerpiece of the Passion story. Since the third century, several locations in and around Jerusalem have been theorized to be the actual site where Christ died. The two most celebrated include the plot of land upon which the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was first constructed in 330 A.D. And this barren outcropping of rock outside the northern wall of the city. 
While the Hebrew prophets made no attempt to identify the exact location of Christ's crucifixion, they did describe, often in precise detail, the events surrounding the death that changed history. It's important to understand that the description of the crucifixion in the ancient Hebrew writings takes place before crucifixion was even implemented as a method of torture and death by the Romans. When David wrote Psalm 22, crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet, hadn't even been thought of. It would have been considered inhumane in the ancient Middle East. And yet the Roman government decides this is one way when you've conquered a country to subjugate these people and keep them under authority, crucify as many as you have to terrorize the population into submission. The actual term crucifixion is not used in the Old Testament. However, there are several ancient references that clearly indicate it was the means of capital punishment by which the Messiah would die. As a result, the fulfillment of messianic prophecy hinged upon a specific historical chronology. The Messiah has to come during the period of the Roman Empire. It's only in that narrow window of time when the Roman Empire rules the world that crucifixion is the means of execution and Jesus comes at the right time, dies the right way in fulfillment of those prophecies. David literally looks down through the halls of history, down through the corridor of time, and a thousand years in the distance sees the Savior suffering and dying and describes it for us in Psalm 22. Biblical scholars have long studied the correlation between the writings of David, Zechariah, and Isaiah, and the gospel accounts of Christ's death. When these Old and New Testament scriptures are compared side by side, the prophetic implications of the passion of Christ are fully realized. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. And they nailed Jesus to a cross. To intensify the pain of crucifixion, Roman soldiers attached victims to the cross by driving spikes five to seven inches long through the hands or wrists and feet. Like David, the prophet Zechariah foretold the wounds created by this torture centuries before the nails ever pierced Christ's body. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child. At nine o'clock on Friday morning, the cross was raised at Golgotha. Pilate had a notice attached above Christ's head, proclaiming the charge against him in three languages. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. During the next six hours, at least 12 specific prophecies were fulfilled. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. They crucified two thieves with him, one on his right and one on his left. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. 
that was again typical of Romans. Uh, you strip the guy's clothes off and put him on the cross and so any of the clothing that was yet considered of any value at all uh, they would gamble for. Uh, so here are the soldiers gambling at the foot of the cross to see who gets the robe of Jesus and that's predicted in Psalm 22 a thousand years before the time of Christ uh, that they have encircled me uh, that they're taunting me and in all of that all of the prophecies of Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are fulfilled in minute detail in the death of Jesus Christ. At noon, the sixth hour by Jewish reckoning, the divine judgment of God echoed over Jerusalem through the forces of the natural world. In that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. As the skies darkened and the temperature dropped, Jesus, nearly dead from loss of blood, summoned his last reserve of strength to call out to God as messianic prophecy again came to fruition. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Back in those days, the Psalms were not numbered. And so the way in which you referred to them was to recite the first line. Well, what is Psalm 22? It's a messianic psalm. It has uh, predictions about the coming of the Messiah. And he was, in effect, there on the cross, applying that to himself, saying, Psalm 22 is coming true in me today. My strength is dried up, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. They gave me vinegar for my thirst. Later, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and lifted it up to his lips. After sipping the bitter wine, Jesus uttered his final words, again in fulfillment of prophecy. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Thousands of men were crucified, but there was only one man who was God, who was crucified. He was taking the sin that we should have taken upon ourselves, upon himself at that moment, bearing the full sin of the world. At that moment, the earth shook and rocks split. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely, he was the Son of God. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. In crucifixion, it is basically a slow death by asphyxiation. You are unable to um, breathe properly and you ultimately suffocate. And so to hasten death on the cross, Romans would typically take a heavy mallet and shatter the shin bones of the victims of crucifixion so they could no longer push up on the cross and breathe properly. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. 
The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. By the time he came to Jesus, Jesus already gave his spirit to the Lord because he was in total control. You see, no one could take it away from him, so he controlled every single uh, second on the cross, and it was just at the perfect time when the Passover lamb is going to be sacrificed at about three to four o'clock in the afternoon that when he gave his life. And Yeshua has predicted that, and indeed, it came to pass. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, and wrapped it in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Near the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb cut out of rock in which no one had ever been laid. They placed Jesus there, and then rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Through the influence of Joseph of Arimathea, a man of wealth and a follower of Christ, the final prophecy of the Passion was fulfilled. And they made his grave with the rich at his death. I think that we have to look at the Passion of the Christ through the lens of these prophecies. This is more than just a story about someone who comes and dies and claims to be the Son of God and the Messiah. It is a fulfillment of these prophecies against all mathematical odds in a miraculous way that validates the claim of Jesus Christ to be who he claimed to be. God, in a sense, created a fingerprint. He said, I'm going to provide predictions. Whoever fulfills these predictions, you will know he is the Messiah who has come to save Israel and the world. These are very specific uh, details that are given in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament. Because I think when you see the prophecy and then you see the exact fulfillment in the New Testament, it all fits together perfectly. Messianic prophecy and New Testament accounts of the Passion of Jesus Christ. In these sacred texts authored centuries apart, prediction and fulfillment have converged to reveal a message for the ages. There is a passage in the Old Testament where God speaks and says, I can declare the end from the beginning. I can predict the future. There is no God like me in all the world. Christianity is the only religion that is based on a hundred prophecies clearly being fulfilled in the life of the founder. It's obvious that these prophecies were intended for us to see the fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why they were given in the first place. For 2,000 years, these prophecies have withstood the critical scrutiny of historians and scholars to forge a compelling case that a carpenter from Nazareth was indeed the promised Messiah. Yet the full significance of these predictions extends beyond Christ's suffering and death. 
you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone had been rolled away. As they entered, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe. Do not be afraid, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Go. Tell his disciples he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Jesus was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the crowning moment of the Passion story and the prelude to a host of prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Over 100 prophecies in the Old Testament that predict details about the first coming of Christ. There are 300 prophecies about the second coming of Christ. I think as we look at the prophecies of the Passion and realize that they were fulfilled exactly as God said they would, and that should give us great comfort in knowing that when he says things are yet to happen, they will happen in the way that he stated. He is coming back again. Jesus said, I will come again to receive you unto myself. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. There's great hope for us in prophecy. Jesus has died, salvation has been secured, Jesus has been raised from the dead, the doors of heaven are open, and now we await for his return. But God has already given us substantial evidence by working these things out, by raising him from the dead. We have a great hope to look forward to. During a Passover week in Jerusalem, Jesus' death validated the predictions of the past. Through his resurrection, he confirmed the hope and promise of the future. There is hope, and the hope is in the Messiah that will give us eternal life, and that will never end. There will be no suffering, there will be no tears, there will be no worries uh, for mankind. Everything will be taken care of, and the Lord will see to us that we live with him and he will be our light and he will be our God through eternity. Because he died on that cross, he will come again. The first time he wore a crown of thorns, next time the scripture says he will wear many crowns. The first time he came in that triumphal entry on the back of a donkey and the second coming will come back on a white horse returning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Do not seal up the words of prophecy, because the time is near. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. As history does unfold, and as these future prophecies are fulfilled, we can have confidence as his followers that we'll spend eternity with God forever in perfect harmony. That gives me great confidence about the future. It gives me great peace about the future. And it tells me that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I have nothing to fear about the future. And Jesus said, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled.